in this lecture we will focus mostly on solving problems. So, let us start with the problem set. Now, in yesterday's class I we discussed the first problem which was a problem of finding moment of inertia about an axis which is perpendicular to the plane of this uh, plane of the object and perpendicular to the uh, uh, going through center of mass. Now, this one we did I mean we did not solve it exactly, but I gave you enough hint I guess you can solve it yourself that will be a good practice for you as well. Now, the next problem is find the moment of inertia of a thin uniform rod about an axis making an angle theta with the rod and passing through center of mass. This one is also an easy problem. In order to solve this, so the situation is this let us say this is the axis which is like this and let us assume that this is the rod in question. So, according to the problem passing through center of mass. Now, if it is an uniform rod the center of mass by the symmetry of it will be the midpoint. So, that means if L is the length of the rod then at each side we have L by 2 and this side we have L by 2 and the angle this angle is theta right. So, we have to find out the moment of inertia for this particular tilt angle theta. Now, recall now, so let, let me draw it again just to just for better clarity because I have marked so many things on it. So, this is my axis end capped, this is my this is the rod in question right. This angle is theta similarly this angle is also theta. Now, dist, uh, so let us assume let us take this as origin. So, we have uh, if I draw an axis here. So, my x axis will be like this and y axis will be passing through this uh, axis of rotation right. Now, for any point let us say any random point at a distance r right. What we need to find is this distance d. Now, this distance we know that it will be d equal to. Uh, so, from the symmetry of the problem it is <coughs> d by r is equal to sin theta which gives d equal to r sin theta. This is also a familiar expression. So, this is essentially uh, mod of r cross n n capped that we have seen earlier. So, moment of inertia according to the standard formula is m i d i square which in integral notation is lambda d l ok. So, this will be d m d square which will be d m we can write lambda d l lambda being the length of this uh, sorry lambda being the mass per unit length for this rod. So, the total mass m can be written as lambda l right. So, lambda is equal to m by l. So, lambda d l and d uh, or we can take a length element as d r for example, not d l then we have r sin theta ok. So, sin theta is a constant here. So, the integration limit is minus l by 2 to l by 2. So, it will be an integration minus l by 2 to l by 2 r d r ok. So, which will give you an i which will be half lambda sin theta and integrating this there is a constant here it will be r square by 2. So, we have taken this half here minus l by 2 to l by 2. Now, if you put this limit it will be now oh, sorry I think we I think I have made a mistake because this actually vanishes ok. So, let me check. 
no sorry it is r square sin square theta so d is r sin theta yeah that makes sense so r square this is sin square theta so it will be r cubed by 3 yeah it has to be this otherwise okay so 3 sin square theta and this will be 2 l cubed by 8 so finally i this will be 4 i will be 1 by 12 now if i can substitute lambda equal to m by l l cubed by yeah so we have already taken this 4 into account which will be i equal to square half m l square also there is a sin square theta here sin square theta so this is the final answer now what happens if we change theta if we put theta equal to 90 degree we simply have half m l square which is a well known result for uh, you know so if the rod is like this and the axis is perpendicular to the rod like this then we have half m l square and if if i put theta equal to 0 degree that means if the rod is along the axis then of course it's an one dimensional object around its own uh, axis the moment of inertia vanishes so the answer is this half m l square sin square theta right now let's move to the next problem problem 3 now this problem uh, in the problem set it's a very conceptual problem it's not much of calculation involved here but we have to understand what we are doing okay so we have what is there we have two symmetric matrices one is i1 which is uh, one some some numbers of course only the six matrix elements are given and these three will be identical to these three similarly here some numbers are given the first matrix looks nice and tidy it has uh, you know very nice numbers very you know easily understandable numbers the second matrix is bit ugly but also it has some uh, ugly because just because it has some numbers which are you know bit long and all but it's also a matrix both of them are real symmetric matrix matrices okay symmetric we can see because only one half is given and real matrices because all the all the elements are real now which one represents a physical moment of inertia tensor that is the question one of this is a physical moment of inertia represents a physical moment of inertia tensor the second one uh, the other one does not to understand this we have to realize that uh, we have to go through the properties of not only the properties of moment of inertia tensor we know that moment of inertia is a real symmetric tensor that is both of them satisfy this so we have to go beyond the properties and look more you know we have to basically try to see which one represents a physical system and which one does not represent now let us look into this matrices carefully we have i1 so let us focus on i1 first we have 1 2 1 0 2 1 and of course we have i2 which I am not writing the explicit form but uh, just write let us say 1.9 0 0.03 minus 0.4 let us say I mean does not matter really because these numbers can be approximated minus 0 0.8 1.6 and it is the rep repetition this half will be the repetition of this half similarly this part will be the repetition of this part now 1 and if we recall the in a moment of inertia tensor we have uh, you know this diagonal elements are the moments of inertia and off diagonal elements are the products of inertia and the general form is i i j is equal to sum over k m k r k square delta i j minus r k i r k j right so this is the general form so we have seen that moment of inertias are inherently positive numbers uh, 
sorry mo the moment of inertia are the diagonal elements and products of inertia are of diagonal elements which could be negative as well because the product of inertia this term will vanish uniformly and then we will have a minus in the integration form the for our expression of product of inertia will be minus rho dv let us say i x y will be minus rho dv x y integration over the entire volume in question. Now, you can ask the first one does not have any negative numbers in the product of inertia tensor and second one has some negative number. Is that the reason? Okay. So, product of inertia in principle we have a negative sign in the integration does not necessarily mean that all the products of inertia will be negative. Let us take an example. Let us say we have one axis system x, y and z. So, we have in the negative direction also negative x, negative y and negative z. Now, let us say we have a mass distribution in this particular axis system which spreads along negative of y and positive of z. So, let us say we have a we have a rectangular sheet standing like this. Okay. So, now if I calculate the product of inertia i x z sorry i y z negative of y i z. So, i y z which will be minus rho. So, it is actually d m d m y z right. So, d m in this case will be sigma d v sigma is the let us say density of them in the surface density of this sheet sigma. Okay. So, we have minus sigma d v not d v d s. So, total mass m will be equal to sigma times s the total total area right or sigma times a if you do not like s. Okay. So, we have d a y z. Now, look at this mass distribution. It is spread over negative of y axis and positive of z axis. So, this integration is over the entire surface, okay, entire, entire area of this disk. This integration will always give you positive value because one of these two quantities y and z is always negative and the other one is always positive. So, resultant i y z will be greater than 0 or could be equal to 0 also. In this case actually it will not be equal to 0, so it will be greater than 0. Right. So, that is why not having a negative value in the product of inertia does not make a tensor invalid. So, that is also not the line of thinking. So, we have three properties, one is or rather we have two properties, one is real, both of them are real, second is symmetric which both of them are symmetric and third one is we should have negative values in the product of I mean we have we can have negative values in the product of inertia term which I have proved that it I mean the integration has a negative side does not mean that it will have negative values. Now, what then what will tell us whether this one is a proper inertia tensor or this one is a proper inertia tensor or both. Now, let us look into this carefully. So, one we have we have i x x equal to 1, i z z equal to 1 and i y y equal to 0. Now, there comes the hint. Now, if i y y equal to 0, what we have seen here? If we put in this example for example, this is a one dimensional system, okay, a rod. If we put theta equal to 0, that means the rod orientation of the rod is along the axis of rotation. Because it is an one dimensional object, then we immediately see that the moment of inertia vanishes. So, in this case, if I extend this picture a bit or if I slightly modify this picture, let us say I have my y axis, x axis and z axis. Okay. So, this is my y, this is my z, this is my x and the rod in question, the one dimensional rod in question is lying along y axis. Then what will happen? If this happens, then your 
moment of inertia around around y will equal will be equal to 0 right and that will give you equal values of moment of inertia around z and around x because it is a one dimensional mass distribution perpendicular to both the axis axis the origin is passing through center of mass. So, in this case we will have i y ok. So, we are doing it for this problem, but anyway i y y equal to 0 i z z equal to i x x equal to some number whatever ok. So, we can have equal numbers in this, but if so that means we are in this tenth in this particular matrix it describes a moment of inertia tensor which is a one dimensional mass distribution around z uh, sorry around y ok. Now, if this happens can we have uh, you know products of inertia all non-zero of course not the product of inertia which includes so that you see the mass distribution is only along y right. So, whenever we have a product of inertia which is along x or along z, this must vanish, it has to vanish. So, all the products of inertia terms, some of the product of inertia term has to be equal to 0, think of it. So, this one cannot represent a physical moment of inertia tensor because if we have a diagonal term 0, then we must have some of the orthogonal term 0. Which ones? I am just leaving on to you. Think of it. Some of the terms has to be equal to 0. This one is free from this problem. We have non-zero diagonal terms, non-zero orthogonal terms. We have some negative, some positive. This is, this can happen. I have just shown you that uh, negative integration can give you positive numbers given that the mass distribution is in the negative direction. So, this is ok and this is not. So, I 2 is the physical moment of inertia tensor, I 1 is not a physical moment of inertia tensor. So, this problem is a very conceptual problem in a sense there is no not much of calculation involved except for that understanding part. We have to understand what the moment of inertia that this tensor these numbers are actually trying to tell us ok. So, this is why I included this into your problem set. I hope you understood and you enjoyed solving this problem with me ok. Now, let us move on to problem number 4 and 5 actually 4 and 5 are very much related with each other. So, let us look at 4 quickly find the moment of inertia of a circular lamella of radius r and mass m about an axis passing through its center and perpendicular to the plane of the wheel. You can use this result for the next problem ok. So, problem number 4 is very 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 simple you must have already done it a million times in your plus 2 standard itself ok. So, let us say this is my axis of rotation and this is my lamella which is lying in the x y plane and the circular lamella has a radius r and mass m and we all know that moment of inertia around this axis will be half m r square ok. So, I think we are all very familiar with this result. So, I am not doing it for you. What I can suggest is you can try one thing you can try to calculate the so i z actually. So, you see that by the symmetry of the problem we discussed. So, this problem has a cylindrical symmetry. So, i x x will be equal to i y y which will not be equal to i z z, but from parallel axis theorem we know that i z z or sorry perpendicular axis theorem we know that i z z equal to i x x plus i y y because it is a 2 D mass distribution. So, what I suggest is you calculate i x x and i y y separate I mean one of the i x x and i y y and see if you get i x x equal to i y y equal to one fourth m r square ok. So, of course, you will get it it has to be because this two combining should give you half m r square and they are contributing equally. So, both of them should be equal to one fourth m r square. So, that is just a side thing probably you are all familiar with it already because this is such a common problem, but let us focus on the next problem which is which is what we target actually. 
The problem is a fly of mass m, small m, rests on a horizontal disc that is freely pivoted about the vertical axis through its center. Initially, the disc is stationary when the fly starts to walk around the circumfer circumference with speed v prime relative to the disc. If r and m are the capital R and capital M are the radius and mass of the bigger disc, okay, then we have to show that the speed of fly with respect to a stationary observer is capital, uh, sorry, v is equal to m v prime divided by 2 m plus v. First, let us try to understand this problem. So, this is the disc in question. We have a fly sitting here very close to the edge. So, it starts walking. Now, if I draw it, draw the top view of the problem. So, this is my disc in question. I hope you can see this. Yes, you can. This is my disc in question, which is pivoted at the center. So, the axis of rotation is just perpendicular to the plane. Okay. So, it is up here as I have drawn. So, we have our fly in question is here. So, at t equal to 0, it starts walk around the rim with a speed v prime which is measured with respect to this this disc right and as you see what happens because it's a frictionless pivot what happens moment this fly starts work walking in the let's say clockwise direction this disc starts rotating in the anti clockwise direction giving rise to a rotational velocity omega. Now, if this happens, this becomes a non inertial frame of reference. So, what is given here is the speed of the fly with respect to the disc, which is a non inertial frame of reference, and what we need to find out is the speed v, which is measured from outside, that is an inertial frame of reference. Writing it in vector notation, recall this r being the radial vector which directed outwards right you recall this this is the standard expression of velocity when observed from an inertial frame v is the velocity of an inertial frame observed from an inertial frame which is the stationary frame v prime is the velocity measured in the rotating frame this one and omega cross r is what we need to find out. So, our job is to find out an expression for omega cross r. Now, do one more step. Now, let us see. Let us assume that the fly is moving in the clockwise direction. So, the disc starts rotating in the anticlockwise direction. Anticlockwise rotation is positive. I think we have discussed it in the in initial part of our uh, lecture that anticlockwise rotation is positive. That means, the direction let us say if this is how the fly is moving then the disc is rotating in this direction anti clockwise that means it is giving rise to an omega which is equal to omega n capped upward direction ok. So, it is the omega is playing uh, you know omega is pointing upwards right. So, we have this now you take a cross product of that omega which is pointing out of the out of the surface of this paper with r and you will see that omega cross r is so at any point instantaneous position i mean is the in the velocity v prime is tangential to the instantaneous position of this position vector r sorry position of this uh, of this fly that means v prime is perpendicular to r and you, you will see that omega cross r will always be in the opposite direction. Okay. So, if I now bring it down to scalar, so v will be v prime minus omega r and as omega and r they are perpendicular to each other, omega cross r will be simply minus omega r. Okay. Try thinking of it of it in this way. Let us assume that fly is moving in anticlockwise direction. That means, the disc is rotating in clockwise direction. That means, omega will be pointing downwards in that case. Once again, you calculate omega cross r. You will see that if fly the fly's movement is in, in this direction, then omega cross r is in this direction. So, whatever you do, 
you will get V equal to V prime minus omega cross R. This is the scalar equation, right? So, this is one thing. Still, we have to figure out what is omega. Now, thankfully, we have the conservation of angular momentum. Now, according to the conservation of angular momentum, the total angular momentum of the disk rotating disk, uh, sorry, yes, right. Total angular momentum of the rotating disk will be I omega, okay, which we have, which by conservation of angular momentum has to be equal to the angular momentum of the fly, which is moving, which is moving with a velocity V prime with respect to this frame, okay, or rather which is moving with a velocity V with respect to a rest frame. And all the conservation laws, I am pressing it again, all the conservation laws are valid only in rest frame. So, if we see from rest frame, only then I can write I omega is equal to R cross M V, right. And this will be and this will once again give you R M V, right. So, omega is equal to R m v by i right now put it into this scalar equation and simplifying r m v by i is equal to half m r square so it will be 2 capital m r square right which will be which will on simplification this will cancel out 2 m v by so, you put it back in here, V will be equal to, okay, I will just write in the next page maybe. So, V will be equal to V prime minus, sorry, yeah, V prime minus 2 M V R by capital M or you change sides v prime will be equal to v times 2 m plus uh, no no I think r oh yeah sorry sorry there is a omega r so right so it will be sorry this is a small mistake here sorry this will be r which will give you omega r is equal to 2 m v by right. So, it will be 2 m plus m divided by m. So, you get v is equal to m v prime by 2 m plus m. So, this is the result we are looking for. Okay. So, I hope this is clear to you all that how to solve this problem, how we did did solve this problem, I will just repeat it once again. Uh, what we did was we initially wrote the equation. So, the velocity v which we need to find out is the velocity is as seen from the rest frame, right. So, we wrote this equation which will which gave us this. Then we wrote the angular momentum conservation in rest frame which gave us a relation with I mean or expression of omega in terms of known parameters put it in here simplifying you get this right. So, there are other uh, there is uh, there are two more problems in the problem set which we will take up in the next class and what we will do is next class we will once again go back to the theory of moments of inertia. We will define something called ellipsoid of inertia. We will try to understand what it is then solve some problems and move on to Euler's equation.